Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. Discerninghearts.com presents The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. Father Wick is the Jesuit priest of the central and southern province of the United States. He currently acts as a retreat master at the White House Jesuit Retreat Center in St. Louis, Missouri. He also serves as a spiritual director at Kenrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis. The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Father Anthony, thank you so much for joining me. It's my joy, Chris. It is such a blessing for us to have you encounter St. Ignatius of Loyola and his great gift to us all of the spiritual exercises. Can you tell us a bit, just so the listeners get to know you, what brought you to first encounter St. Ignatius? So I would say the roots of my Ignatian charism go back to my father, who grew up in St. Louis, where I currently reside. Went through Jesuit education, high school here, and then a couple of years of college. And he imbibed a lot of Jesuit spirituality about choosing a way of life that would be to the praise, reverence, and service of God, some discerning spirits. And he, two years into college, came to White House on retreat, where I currently reside also, and thought, I wonder if I'm called to the religious life. I'm going to give that a try. And so he went out to the Trappist at Gethsemane. They suggested a smaller Trappist monastery. So he ended up in Utah for four years, loved it, had a good experience with the monks out there. They were very serious uh, in their silence and their prayer and dedication and their work and the properties. So he had a wonderful experience there, but started having health problems. And the abbot came to him and said, Greg, we love having you here, but I don't think this is your vocation. So he came back to St. Louis, met up with a Jesuit he trusted, who lived on campus, Father Boland. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for Father Joe Boland, God rest his soul. And he asked Father Boland, said, Father, if a guy is not called to the religious life, where's the best place to raise a family? So you see there, my dad is already thinking outside of himself. Where's the best place to raise a family? Now, he grew up in a family of moderate means, and Grandpa was the accountant for a big apartment store here. He started this wonderful group called the Legion of a Thousand Men to get people to adore uh, the Blessed Sacrament and to drop money for the Pink Sisters to keep them afloat. He did a lot of fundraising for the Cardinal Archbishops of St. Louis. Anyway, Dad gave all that up. He gave up the city life that he knew because Father Bowen, in his response, said, the best place to raise a family is definitely on a farm. (laughs) So my dad went up to Montana that next summer. He had a brother and a sister up there. Uh, just to see if he could work on a farm, see if he could do that, see if he could enjoy that. And so he goes up to Montana and begins working on a ranch. He finishes up his studies at Carroll College, meets mom, who's from Glacier National Park. She didn't know about farming either, but they were both willing to follow the recommendation of this Jesuit. And so I grew up in Oregon, sixth of nine children, on a farm, as dad was recommended to do. What a beautiful life. What a wonderful life. We had on the farm Jesuits come and visit us. Ignatius Press would come each summer and they would do a working vacation reading manuscripts and detailing out manuscripts and Father Fessio and and the whole team would come. And so we got to know them well. We played basketball with them. We had a wonderful experience there. When Father Fessio and others started the St. Ignatius Institute at the University of San Francisco, which was a great books program for reading the classics of Western civilization within the University of San Francisco. I went there and five of my six older siblings also went there. I was the sixth child. And there we were formed in Ignatius spirituality. We met more wonderful Jesuits who taught us, not only Jesuits taught there, but primarily there were. And we uh, imbibed more Ignatian spirituality. Still at this time, though, I was planning on raising a family, uh, hoping to get married and raise a family like mom and dad did on the farm, maybe. And so I entered the business world out of college after graduating with philosophy and math degree and and still keeping in contact with Jesuits and starting to go on eight-day retreats now, uh, once a year, weekend at least retreats and some, some longer retreats. And this kind of rocked my world each time. It would kind of reorient myself 
as I would go through the exercises towards St. Ignatius. So as I think about it, yes, most of those were weekend retreats. But reorient my life like, why am I here? What am I doing here? How can I best praise reverence and serve God? It, it was a reorientation for me about exactly that. I was only one year in the business world in the Bay Area before I heard about a small school starting up in Phoenix, Arizona. Ended up teaching there for three years, fifth and sixth grade. Loved it. Taught the kids, you know, if you do God's will, you'll really be happy in life. I really believe that. But then some of the mothers, here's the key. Some of the mothers came to me and with great innocence and simplicity said, Anthony, have you thought about being a priest? You'd be a great priest. Now, of course, in our culture today, we don't make a distinction between being religious and being a priest. We see all men as either being priest or layperson, but we should really sp- think more in terms of religious life in general. But anyway, so they were challenging me to think about that, and I didn't like that compliment. In other words, I was like, why does every guy, decent guy, have to be a priest? We need good husbands and fathers, which we do. But I could see also that there was some blockage in me. Like they're offering me an innocent and beautiful compliment to consider the priesthood. And I did love the priesthood, but only at a distance. I wanted. God to bless my plans, and my plans were for marriage and family, like mom and dad experienced. So I had a Dominican spiritual director, and I asked him, why does that bother me so much interiorly? To the women who offered this compliment, of course, I was kind. Oh, thank you very much. No, I don't think that's for me. But interiorly, I was disturbed. I asked him why it disturbed me so much, and he said, you're probably not as open to God's will as you think you are. And I I responded, well, guilty as charged. I accept that. What should I do? And he said, well, you should pray more. You should go to the sacraments more, and God will give you a sign of what to do. So I was waiting for my sign. And one of my Jesuit friends came through town, gave a talk at our school. We went for a car ride afterwards. And I told him, I said, I love this life of teaching. I thought maybe I would do that long term. I've always thought I'd get married, raise a family, even on a farm, perhaps. But the priesthood idea is coming to the fore, maybe following Jesus in that way. I'm not crazy about it, but I just wanted to tell you about this. And he looked at me and he said, do you know about the Casa Balthazar in Rome? And I said, I've heard about that place, but I don't know anything about it. He said, he kind of pointed and he said, that would be the perfect place for you. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, I think that's my sign, my sign from heaven that my spiritual director promised I would have. And so I took the next plane to Rome basically that summer. I had to try out this house of discernment to live a life of the uh, poverty, chastity, obedience, to live the religious life and to see if it fit. And as I was living that life, I, I went over there hoping that it wouldn't work out. Lord, okay, I'm giving you two years to discern my vocation. Please don't let this work out. <laughs> Negotiating with the Lord. So during those two years, what fundamentally happened? Well, I realized I had a lot of rough edges, what Ignatius calls inordinate attachments things I was clinging to, my way of doing things, my frustrations, my way of of trying to get God to come to my way of seeing and acting. And as I recognized those, embarrassing as that was, and started to ask the Lord Lord for help to let go of those, especially through prayer, which are indeed the spiritual exercises, the five forms of prayer to help us let go of our inordinate attachments, I began to open up. And on my, we would do annual eight-day retreats there, And as I began opening up and getting to know the religious founders, I began to be more and more free. I would read about the various religious founders, Benedict, Francis, Dominic, Ignatius too. And when I read Ignatius, he was such a father to me, such a father. I couldn't believe it. I was like, here I've gone to Jesuit schooling. We've had all this Jesuit influence, but I never dreamed that I would be called to be a Jesuit. I thought there was too much conflict within the Jesuits. I thought that, um, I don't know, it was too exalted or something. Um, I just never saw myself as a Jesuit. And as I got to know Ignatius and pray to him and speak with him and read his letters, we have more extant letters from him than any other 16th century personage, uh, bar one, and read his letters. They just spoke to me so deeply. So I, I I was beginning to realize that he was choosing me. And perhaps that's true, Chris, that In the spiritual life, the saints choose us even more than we choose them. So that that was my experience with St. Ignatius, and I began this journey of beginning to say yes to him, feeling this call as I became more free to follow him, to to follow his charism uh, and to enter the Jesuits. Each charism is an angle at which we follow Jesus, a true angle where we see Jesus accurately, 
but from a Jesuit angle, not a Benedictine angle, not a Dominican angle or Franciscan. They're all different angles that were all following Jesus in the primary ways of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but from a particular angle, whatever God gives to us. I applied to the Jesuits of the southern province, which at that time was between Florida and New Mexico, entered and began this journey of formal Jesuit studies after two years of discernment of Rome and then three years at the Jesuit University called the Gregorian there. So I began my journey with St. Ignatius, and it's been a wonderful journey ever since, and I've been learning so much about him. He was so influential at the Casa Balthazar. He was the the bedrock to understand discernment of spirits, how to draw everything of our lives into this praise, reverence, and service of God. Yeah, it's so interesting that the founders of the Casa would be, of course, Father Fezio, but at that time, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, as well as Cardinal Schornborn, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And when you speak of charisms, the way that you described it was so beautiful. It reminds me of a prism. The one light, that pure white light hits, and because of the angle of the prism, it, it eventually displayed in all these different colors. Same light source, but is expressed in a different in a different color, as it were. It, am I making that too simplistic? That's a lovely image, because that means that they all work together. All these charisms come from the Lord, the same source, and they all work together in their particular color, with a red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, or violet, you know, all the different principal charisms in the church. I'm not sure which color the Jesuits would be. <laughs> I would have a guess, but uh, but that's right. Yeah, they all come from the same light source and lead us into the fullness of light. It needs to be said, doesn't it, though? It, because it has that same source, it, it's meant to, uh, whatever the charism is, to help feed the world and to help feed souls to bring them to the source, the light. And I'm speaking capital L, the Lord, to bring them to Christ by that particular approach. And for St. Ignatius, it, we can't say that it was just for those who have a Ignatian spirituality or a Jesuit calling. It really became a great gift to the whole world, didn't it? So true. So true. Yes. These are the ways that, so God calls us to himself. And these are the ways that we are, whether we're lay or a religious we're enamored with the Lord, and these particular aspects of Jesus are enamoring for us. They, they just call us out of ourselves. This is each person kind of fighting their own charism, reading different saints, and noticing which saints really speak to them and draw them into the heart of the Lord. So nothing replaces that personal encounter, that real encounter with Jesus. So all saints lead towards that, and all charisms lead towards that too. It'll come under the rubric, though, of a certain... There'd be a certain aspect. It's something about the Carmelite charism or the Franciscan charism that really speaks to us of who Jesus is. It really enlivens us, fills us with light. We'll return to The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises with Father Anthony Wick in just a moment. This is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts a nonprofit Catholic apostolate dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio and video productions which are faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. Its mission responds to the Church's call to use the media for evangelization, catechesis, and spiritual renewal. We have made a commitment since the beginning to make the truth shared through Discerning Hearts totally free to users throughout the world. Besides our website, DiscerningHearts.com, Discerning Hearts has a newly updated free app where users can find all their favorite Discerning Hearts programming, including Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more. There, too, you'll find numerous beautifully produced devotionals and novenas, including the Holy Rosary and Stations of the Cross, to help users create a sacred time for prayer wherever they may be. Discerning Hearts programming can be found on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. Discerning Hearts also has an ever-growing YouTube channel. 
Discerning Hearts online spiritual retreats and seminars have helped souls in North and South America, Europe, Africa, Australia, the Middle East, and the Philippines. For many people all around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. We can only do this thanks to the generous financial support of our friends and benefactors. Please consider donating to our mission today. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Your support is very much needed and appreciated. Please keep our mission in your prayers and tell a friend about Discerning Hearts. We now return to The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. And as you said, that the saints very often, I believe it's totally true too, they, we don't choose them, they choose us. And to be chosen, particularly by St. Ignatius, it really speaks of that fatherhood, of the guidance, the patrimony, the paternal caring, that he would have for you as a son in this quest that you have. Yes. So each father, this is a good image of, of a father. St. Paul says all fatherhood comes from God the Father. And some of us have really not had good fatherhood examples. We've had, Everyone has a dad, but you don't necessarily have a father when you grow up a biological father. But St. Ignatius is such a spiritual father. The root word, for instance, of a father exercising his authority, the root word of authority, either comes from autor, which means author, or augere, A-U-G-E-R-E, augere, which means to help flourish, to help thrive. So like a farmer who would bend over the plant and offer the plant everything that it needs to thrive, water, sunlight, nutrients, so too, any true fatherhood helps us to flourish. So experiencing St. Ignatius for me, was an experience of his fatherhood. And anyone, lay person or not, who prays to St. Ignatius, begins to read St. Ignatius, when they experience full flourishing, he indeed might be their father. It's amazing how that works. I, for instance, had a personal desire to be a spiritual son of Padre Pio, whom I admire and still do very much. But I am not a spiritual son of Padre Pio. I've tried many times <laughs> to novenas and whatnot and still admire him so greatly. And yet, I know I'm not his spiritual son. And that's not the angle at which I'm supposed to be following Jesus. It's a beautiful angle. I appreciate it very much. But it's a it's a different color of the rainbow, if you will. It's not the angle at which my heart flourishes. As much as I will always admire him, I'll always admire different saints as do you, Chris. But we have to find our particular charism. What is that particular saint? And there are various saints, not just one, who cause us to flourish. When we read their writings, oh, it, we just feel the fire of the Lord's love entering into us and burning away the dross and giving us this zeal that's very similar to their own to surrender ourselves yet more to the Lord. Now, Father, what would you say to somebody who's listening right now? And this is a whole new idea for them. I mean, this is something that they've never really heard before. And they're not sure, well, I don't know if I, I have a, a saint that's picked me or I'm not sure of how to move forward. Can you speak to that person right now? Certainly. My first experience with Discerning Hearts was listening to your podcast with Dr. Anthony Lillis on St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, blessed at that time. And that was so enlivening for me. She's one of those who's also chosen me. So here she is Carmelite. It's not only Jesuit saints who choose me. And as I was listening to that wonderful podcast and the many episodes of it, it was speaking to me so deeply. So all of us have different saints who have chosen us, and it's a matter of letting go of the blockage between us and the Lord. The Lord gives these vehicles of his grace to us, and so we need to experience these saints. We need to read about them. I, I suggest listening to Discerning Hearts and listening to the different podcasts of different saints and various interlocutors with you, Chris, who are speaking of their experience and sharing the wisdom and the the charism of that saint with your audience. And just note which ones really cause something, a deep stirring within you. So, I mean, I think you'll appreciate any saint. You and I appreciate all kinds of saints, but which ones cause some deeper stirring that listen to those deeper stirrings? Uh, so it's a it's an experiential task of 
getting to know these different saints and then begin praying to them. They're not just uh, plaster <laughs> models for us who have it together. They're very real. They've had their struggles. They've processed their inordinate attachments, things that they cling to for security in this life. Try to find out what those are and then note how they overcame them and then pray for their inspiration. I'll tell you one other story if I'm not speaking too much. I always thought that my patron saint was St. Anthony of Padua because growing up, that's the only St. Anthony I knew. Well, I was at the Casa Baltazar, and in Europe, you may know that the name days are of your feast day for your patron saint, so St. Anthony, are more celebrated than are your birthdays, which I think is a lovely tradition. Like In a way, we should really be celebrating our baptism day more than our birthdays. That's the entryway into the covenant huh, of the church, but be that as it may. So they celebrate feast days greatly. Well, each January, Father Survey would write me, congratulating me on the feast day of St. Anthony of Egypt. So St. Anthony of Egypt, the founder of Western monasticism, the great discerner of spirits, going out into the desert to encounter the Lord and to learn all these riches that people came from the towns to learn from him. So I corrected Father Father Survey and I said, oh, I think I'm St. Anthony of Padua. And so he said, oh, sorry about that. And then the next January, he would write me again in January. <laughs> and I said, I think I'm St. Anthony of Padua. And then at one point, so he kept making this mistake of greeting me for St. Anthony of Egypt's feast day in January. And so I went to him once. I was like, I wonder if you could be insightful, though. I wonder if St. Anthony of Egypt could be my, my patron saint. I just presumed all my life that it was St. Anthony of Padua. He said, well, do a novena to each saint. And note which saint responds. <laughs> so I did that. And you can guess what my answer is going to be, you know, St. Anthony of Egypt. You know, I love that. And it's not that you can only have one. It's kind of like love. Love doesn't divide, it just multiplies. And their interaction in our life is really a gift from the Father, his great love for us, kind of guide us, isn't it? Yes. I still appreciate, of course, St. Anthony of Padua. And likely he was named after St. Anthony of Egypt. So there's no division there. But as far as my go-to as a patron saint, I am so grateful Dr. Anthony Lillis gave me his patron saint is also St. Anthony of Egypt. And when I visited him in Denver at the seminary years ago, he gave me a, a picture, uh, a beautiful painting of St. Anthony of Egypt. I still have that on my wall. Wow. Well, it's so interesting, too, that when you look at the life of St. Ignatius, you do see that moment when the saints started choosing him. But it, it took a while. They actually, he had to be laid low, didn't he? He had to be totally at a point where he just could not move anymore. And then something extraordinary happened, didn't it? Yes. So St. Ignatius, a little bit of background there, born in 1491, a year before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, in the fiercely independent Basque part of Spain, middle nobility, you can still see the castle where he grew up, five foot thick walls to handle cannon walls. He had all these plans for making a dent in the world for these glorious exploits and how he was going to change the world, how he's going to influence the world. He was never a trained soldier, as, as many falsely believe, but he was trained meticulously in the art of chivalry, so he knew how to wield a sword. And when the French invaded Pamplona in 1521, almost exactly 500 years ago, he thought it was his bounden duty to help defend the fort. And so he roused the Spanish soldiers and, and they were being strengthened by his, his lead. He was such a natural leader. But then this cannonball ripped through his legs, took out his left calf and his right shin. He hobbled for the rest of his life because that cannonball was admired for his courage, though, in the French, while war was a different thing back then, carried him, the French carried him by litter back to the family castle in Loyola. He's there recuperating, going through two surgeries uh, without anesthesia, breaking his leg twice, having a piece of his bone sawed off. He was very vain. He wanted his stockings, those tight stockings men used to wear in those days to look good. He had to look good for the ladies. Up to the age of 26, he says in his autobiography, he was given over to a, a life of vanities of the world. So a Catholic all his life, but not a very good one. From a very large family, youngest of, the, of a very large family, I think 13 kids, maybe 15. So he worked as a page of the court of Spain. And he, at one point, he says in his autobiography, he just wanted to 
when the hand of a lady, so it, when he's in convalescence there in the family castle, his sister-in-law had just cleaned out the books of the castle. He wants books on chivalry to read, knights rescuing damsels in distress and the like. And there's no books there. All they have is A Life of Christ by Ludolf of Saxony and A Lives of the Saints called The Golden Legend by Veragini. Well, beggars can't be choosers. So he begins reading these books. He's kind of disappointed. That's all they have. But he says, as I began reading these books, a conversion grace began to enter my heart. He says in his autobiography that he could go on for hours thinking about first how he would win the hand of a certain woman in his life, higher than a duchess, higher than a countess, may have even been the princess of Spain. We don't know. But it's good for a man to have to win the hand of a woman. So it made him feel, it would take him out of his doldrums. He would feel uh, the cure, the stimulus, if you will, was kind of boredom. Then he would choose this habit of thinking about winning the hand of this woman, how he was going to do that, how he was going to use his chivalric talents to impress her. And he said he could go on for hours thinking about this. And these thoughts left him, they brought a reward. So the cue leads to the habit, which leads to a reward. But then he said, when I would dismiss them from weariness, they left me sad and dissatisfied. And he said, but then other times when I'm reading about the saints, and here we go, Francis and Dominic, he begins to fall in love with Francis and Dominic and saying like, wow, maybe they're the real men. I thought I was the real man. He counted on his muscles, if you will, <laughs> his his physical abilities. His he thought that's what it was to be a man was was this kind of strength and resolve and and uh, chivalric way of acting. And he thought maybe they are the real men. Look at the way that they sacrifice themselves. And indeed, the measure of a man is his ability to sacrifice himself. What if I imitated them? So he said I could go on for hours imitating them. So the cure stimulus, the boredom would lead to this habit of thinking about imitating Francis and Dominic, going to the Holy Land, performing the rigors that they performed, although he also thought about outperforming them. <laughs> He's very competitive. And he begins to think about just going to the Holy Land for the rest of his life and living a simple life of conversion. And he said that he could go on for hours thinking about these thoughts too. And these thoughts left him cheerful and consoled. And he said, for the first time, I realized that there were different spirits working. By the fruits, you will know them, Jesus says. So by the end point, he could tell that some thoughts left him sad and dissatisfied, in his case, winning the hand of this woman. It means that there was a self involved. There was a little bit too much self-orientation there. It wasn't a godly project he was about. He wasn't receiving it in a Marian, godly way. He was trying to prove himself. I can relate to that. Up to the age of 26, I was doing the same in my own way, trying to get married, raise a family, all these good things. But there was too much Anthony in all of that. I was kind of centered on self, wanting God to bless my plans, my desires. Ignatius was experiencing the same. And so when he would think about imitating Francis and Dominic, those thoughts left him cheerful and consoled. He realized it was the good spirit, he says. So that would be the Holy Spirit or any good angel or your guardian angel inspiring him. So he resolves to do exactly that, to follow the good spirit, to let go of that that evil spirit. Incidentally, my father had a wonderful uh, insight before he died two and a half years ago. He said, you can tell the difference between an eagle and a hawk by the end of their wings. So hawk's wings go straight out all the way, and the eagle's wings at the very end bend upwards. That's how you tell the difference between, and we're called to soar like the eagles, if you will. So it's part of discernment to know where do these thoughts lead? Do they leave me cheerful and consoled, more desirous, more zealous for giving my life to Christ? That's a sign of the good spirit working. And so he resolves to head towards Jerusalem and spend the rest of his life there. And so St. Ignatius, with this new resolution, decides he's going to follow Francis and Dominic for the rest of his life. He leaves the family castle. He's now in large part recuperated. He's heading towards Jerusalem. He decides to make a vigil of arms at the Benedictine Monastery of Montserrat. Montserrat means serrated mountains, and indeed when you see them, they are serrated mountains. And he goes to the Benedictine Monastery, spends many days making a general confession of all his past life. He starts to struggle with scruples. He gets help with that, but then not so much help, and he has to learn his way through scruples. He becomes very, a great saint to help us if any of us struggle with scruples. He has very, various wonderful counsels on how to do that, also found in the spiritual exercises. 
and he prays there. He does a vigil of arms. So a vigil of arms, standing or kneeling all night long, instead of doing this for the queen, I whom a knight would be knighted the following day with the sword, tapped on the shoulder, he does it for a new queen. Understand how much he's learning to turn his life over to spiritual things. And he sees in the Blessed Mother a true woman who desires his all, who desires all of these exploits that he's been planning for an earthly woman to be her own. And so there in front of that lovely statue of Montserrat, which you can see today, beautiful uh, sitting Madonna, black Madonna with a black child, a beautiful black statue. He does this vigil of arms all night long, standing or kneeling. As dawn comes, he leaves his sword there. He goes outside. He finds a beggar. He's wearing all this nightly garb, and he switches out clothing, and he takes the beggar's clothing, and he begins walking away as a beggar. And he's heading now towards Jerusalem, but he stops at this place called Montserrat. He decides, before I make it to Jerusalem, I would like to do some prayer. I need to pray more. I need to do some fasting and penance for all my life of past sins. And here's a cave. Here's a little cave overlooking the Cardonair River. And I think I'm going to stay here for a couple of weeks. Well, he has no idea what he's in for. The Lord is going to be bestowing upon him a whole cataract, a cataract of mystical graces. And those two weeks become ten and a half months of mystical graces and various experiences and visitations of the Blessed Mother. He's really downloading from God all kinds of prayer forms and He's having so many profound mystical experiences. He said, God was treating me as a schoolboy. He was so overwhelmed. St. Ignatius is truly a mystic of the first order in the church. And he begins writing down all these notes in a little journal he's carrying, which, by the way, will become the spiritual exercises. He begins sharing these notes with the people of Manresa. He's also working at a hospital doing humble tasks like cleaning bedpans because he knows that he was very fastidious about his looks and appearance and how people viewed him. And so he begins doing these humble menial tasks. He knows that from humiliation comes humility, which is indeed still true for us. And he's sharing the insights he's gaining from his prayers and how the different spirits are moving on him. He's beginning to write his discernment of spirits, how the good spirit, how can you tell a good spirit from an evil spirit? This thought that I have, this inspiration that I have, is it from the good spirit? Or the evil spirit. I sometimes joke when people say, oh, I feel very inspired about this. And I say, well, which spirit, though, is inspiring you? <laughs> As he's speaking with these people, they are amazed. And they're like, that's exactly how God works in me, too. That's very insightful. Thank you so much. So he realizes that the gifts given him are meant for others. This is really critical to the Ignatian spirituality. He's not some great saint you and I look up to, and oh, isn't he amazing? Or isn't he intellectual? Or a giant in his own right, or someone just on fire with the Lord's love. He's incredibly imitable. I think that's what makes him so apropos to our age and a gift, a particular gift to the church. He's very imitable in teaching us this gift of discerning spirits, teaching us how to order our lives to the praise, reverence, and service of God. He continues on his journey to the Holy Land from there. We'll continue our conversation in our next episode. You've been listening to The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick. This episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation which is fully tax-deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Heart of the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola with Father Anthony Wick.